Good morning, everyone. We're happy to announce that Mary Ruth Fowler is back at her uh, home from the hospital, and she's doing very well. And she wants to thank everyone for the prayers, the cards, and the phone calls, all of which gave her added strength and determination to get through her surgery and recover. We'll begin our worship service with our prelude. The call to worship. Come, all who would walk anew in the presence of the Lord. In God's eyes, we are all washed as white with snow, as snow. So lift up your hearts in praise. Jesus came to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to bring recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the time of God's favor. Baptized in water. 
As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called to struggle against everything that would lead us away from the love of God and loving our neighbors. We must therefore confess wherein we have failed to overcome those, these negative things in our lives and to ask God's help in doing what he asks. Let us pray. Gracious God, we confess to you and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts, minds, and strengths, and we have not loved our neighbors as if they were ourselves. Sadly, we have not forgiven others in the way we want to be forgiven. Have mercy upon us, O God. We have been deaf to your call to serve Christ by serving others as he did. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Accept our confessions and restore us to your place of acceptance. This we ask in Jesus' name, the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Let us lift up to God our private personal prayer request during this moment of silence. In Jesus' name we pray. God does not desire the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live in his mercy. May what we do each day be pleasing to God, so that the rest of our lives may be lived faithfully through the power of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May be seated. Morning. Good morning. We'll have the litany of the word for prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds to the power of your Holy Spirit, so that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you are trying to say to us this day. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 4a from the Living Bible, paraphrased. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your kindred, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and all you. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had directed him, and Lot went with him. The Psalter is from Psalm 121, from the Living Bible, paraphrased. Lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence will my help my come? come? My help comes from the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. He will not let my foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber or sleep nor slumber. The Lord is our keeper, the shade of our right hands. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will maintain our lives. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in. From this time on and forever. The epistle reading is from Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 5 and 13 through 7 from the Living Bible. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Not to one who works, wait, now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, 
but as something due that person. To one who is without works, yet trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, then faith is null and the promise is void. For the Lord law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all Abraham's descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives to the dead and calls into existence the things that we that do not exist. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. The good news reading comes from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning with the first verse of the 17th chapter. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and his brother John, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, 
and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he, as Peter, was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed him. And from the cloud, a voice said, This is my beloved son. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground, for they were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus by himself standing there alone. And as they came down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had been raised from the dead. May the Lord add his blessing to hearing his holy word this morning. May you understand his truth for us yet this very day. As I told you, the Sunday before the beginning of Lent was supposed to be about the Mount of Transfiguration story. And then I knew that two weeks later, it would be a main part of the sermon again. So I decided not to do it at that point, but this morning. The Mount of Transfiguration, an amazing story. And it's several factors in it that makes it extremely more interesting. First of all, why did Jesus take Peter, James, and John with him? Peter makes sense. He was the leader of the disciples. So whatever he saw, he shared with the rest of them. That makes sense. James, the son, the brother of John, the second pair of that were invited to be disciples, okay. But James never really is known for anything other than being called to be a disciple. John, the youngest of the disciples, wrote books, wrote, became the protector and provider for Jesus' mother Mary. He had an important ministry within the faith of Jesus Christ. So, yeah, he makes sense. But James, I would have thought Jesus would have talked Peter, Andrew, and John. You know, Andrew was the one that introduced Peter to Jesus. Yes. Andrew was connected with the baptism of John in the Jordan. And he invited his brother Peter to come along with him one time. And that happened to be the time that Jesus was there as well. And that's how Jesus and Peter first met. Before Peter and Andrew and the rest were called to be his disciples. They knew him, but they had no direct relationship. So this is the story of the Mount of Transfiguration. And as the writer tells us, the transfiguration is seen in the face and the clothing of Jesus. That he was transfigured before them. He, he looked different. His face shone. His clothes shone. He looked different than he had just previous to this moment. And then... Moses and Elijah come and start talking with him. And I always try to image this, that here's Jesus, and here's Moses and Elijah, and the three of them are talking. And over here are Peter, James, and John, and they're together, but they're not part of this group, really. And Peter says, well, Lord, what we ought to do is we ought to build three buildings for you to live in here on the mountaintop. Obviously, Peter had no idea what was happening right in front of his eyes. He wanted to make this permanent. Jesus wasn't about being 
permanently forever on the mountain. He wasn't to be an idol or something we worshipped on the mountaintop. Now, if we look at the other parts of that land, this is where most of the temples were on mountains. You went up onto the mountain to worship God, whichever God it was you were worshiping. So Peter wanted to make this a permanent place. And Jesus was so excited about that. And then after Peter says this, there's a voice that comes out of a cloud that covers them all. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. That's interesting, the reaction that that voice has upon the three disciples. They fall flat, face forward onto the ground. They know they are in the presence of one who is greater than they are, greater than Christ. They're in the presence of God himself. And it just overwhelms them. And then what happens? Jesus goes over and touches them. Get up, get up, get up. And when they look up, what do they see? Just Jesus. No longer glowing. Remnants aren't flashing light. It's Jesus. Wait a minute. Jesus takes them up on the mountain, is transfigured into something else, and yet... When they look at him again, he's like he was before. That's because he was more than transfigured. He was transformed. Something happened on that mountaintop that is very, very important for us to understand. Who was Jesus up to this point? He was the carpenter's son. He was the one who was going around Galilee and the other places where he went as a teacher, a miracle worker, as a preacher. He was interacting with people on a one-to-one basis. Thousands came to see him. He taught, he healed, he ministered. And that's what he was. But what is he after the Mount of Transfiguration? He is the Messiah. All of a sudden, he has now set his mind and his face to go to Jerusalem and do what God is asking of him, which is to sacrifice himself so that we all might be free of our sins. From that point on, from the point of the transfiguration, the transformation in his ministry is evident. From that point on, he is not so concerned with what's going on in the world around him, but in what the world needs to become for eternal life to take place. That our lives might not end with our last breath but go on for all eternity with him. If we look at the rest of the passages following this, we can see that Jesus is focused on, oriented to, moving to Jerusalem to do what God has called him to do. Now that's what we're doing here in Lent. We're looking at what God has called each one of us to do what we're supposed to be doing in the name of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be living lives that are vastly different from the people around us. Yet while they're vastly different, often the differences are subtle. Think about that. We do not live lives that are very drastically different from the people who live near us. We don't live some kind of barren, self-effacing life that has nothing to do with this world's things. We live a life of faith in the midst of the world. We're called to show God's love 
to the people around us. Now, how does God show his love to us? Do we have blinding flashes of electricity and light to come pouring down upon us? No. There's little things, little sudden understandings that we didn't think about before, sudden opportunities to do the right thing, even though we might want to do the wrong thing. All of that is subtle. It is part of what our daily Christian life is like. Yes. I noticed that one of the things that I always think about, that when I finally came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for myself, dirty jokes just weren't fun anymore. You know, thinking about the worst of people and the worst of this world just didn't intrigue me. From that point on, I tried to look for what was best in people. My friends in college, my friends in the ministry, my friends in the churches I served, the people I tried to minister to, took on a whole different sense. It was there, not, like I said, highly visible to other people, but it was there. I saw things happening within my congregations that uh, I just had to step back and say, yes, Lord, you're doing that, not me. People are living out lives that I could never live. I remember one of the first patients, uh, prisoners, he was dying of cancer. I mean, the rumbling in her body was audible to everybody around her. But the one thing she never did was thought about herself. She was always thinking about somebody else. She was always trying to do something for somebody else, not for herself. I'll tell you, I was impressed. I remember a young man who was also a friend of mine in the fire department, volunteer fire department that I was part of. And he's dying of cancer. He's got two brothers. One who probably should have been in the state penitentiary all of his life. The other who just was going to be a family man, and probably had three children, live an ordinary life. But Kenny, Kenny would have, could have made a difference in this world. And yet here he was dying. I'm like, Lord, what in the world are you doing? What are you doing? Well, the impact that his death had upon his father was something that I just could not imagine. He went from being the captain of the local fire department to being the state instructional of how to fight fires. From the little town of Aquaga, New York, you cannot find it on the map to the state of New York, helping volunteers know how to fight fire. And I think he took that job because of what Kenny would have done if he did. I've got many other examples of that, where God works through us in such unusual, unexpected ways, most of which are not highly proclaimed or noticeable. But yet you can see, if you stop and think about it, what a wonderful thing this person or that person has done. And it can be said about each person in this room. Don't think so? Ask some of your friends sometimes what impresses them about you. You will be shocked by what they think of you compared to what you think about yourself. For they will see, if you're being faithful to Christ, the love of Christ in you to them. Now, some churches try to make this a professional thing that the laity are supposed to do. No. 
Jesus wants us to live our lives as our lives. And through our lives, he will minister to those around us. He's not going to focus a spotlight on you. He's not going to ask you to do things you can't do. But he'll ask you to do them in such ways that it benefits other people. Simple little things. Like writing that card for Donna Hutchinson. We all know the pain she's been going through. We wish it had not happened. We wish that that's not the route everything took. But now that she has a need which only God can truly solve, we need to reach out to her with the love of this church, with the love of the people that she interacted with, with the love of the people who care about her, and let her know this church loves her, no matter what. This church loves her. And we can do that for many other people that we know. And I ask God to show you the way. Amen. I'll get it. God, we offer unto you these our gifts, a portion of what you've given us, in a way of saying thank you for all that you've given us. We ask your blessing upon these gifts and those that it will minister to. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
besides Mary Ruth, Donna and Joan, and others that we know, who else do we need to share this morning in our prayer requests? Yes. Okay, your parents, and especially your father, facing a long time of recovery. Yes. Sarah, our daughter-in-law. Any others? Oh, yes, Barbara. Okay, your daughter-in-law. It's her liver. Okay. Any others? So we go before God in prayer. Gracious God, we are amazed the way you call people together as your servants, disciples, believers. You call us into groups that strengthen us one with the other so that while we each are called to minister in our own name, we're called to be parts of groups that can reach many more people by the number of people each one knows is multiplied as we gather together. And so while we may not sense we have got a lot of influence on the world around us, if we really stop and think about it, we see that it comes from a multitude of people that we are interacting with and in contact with. Lord, we understand your call to be faithful, to live a life that you lived, that we might share what we believe with those who want to know. In our world today, we see so many things that just seem like the world is in a greater turmoil than it's ever been. Weather conditions that are just overwhelming. People trapped in their own homes for hours, for days, unable to get out because others can't get in. Those who are dealing with tornadoes and ice storms, cold weather. Nature itself seems to be in a turmoil. And as we look at our nation and the nations of the world, the struggles that are going on, situations in which thousands of people are dying, for what seems to be no reason at all. And others dying by the thousands in natural calamities, the earthquake, storm, and fire. Lord, it is our prayer that not you will you will not only protect us and Help us live the way you want us to live. But that you will help people caught in all of these tragedies. Whether it be from the overuse of guns to hurt one another. Or people not caring about how they drive, putting others in danger. Lord, 
We know you're the answer that we cannot make up. Your answer is life itself. So we ask that that life might be extended to those that we're praying for in this moment, whether it be a matter of physical, mental, or other kinds of health that we need, that are needed by those we care about. All of this we ask in your name, who taught us to pray with these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And let us not be led into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and glory forever. Other than the brief announcements that are in the bulletin, I have one other. We have candy to sell after church downstairs. So if you want a box of candy, it's there waiting for you uh, to be purchased. Anything anybody else needs to lift up? All right, we'll close with Lift High the Cross.
forth in his peace. Share his love with all you meet. May you be blessed in all your efforts. Go now in his name. Amen. Thank you.